Thank you, Marda, and thank you, everybody. Thank you the, uh, to the other panelists for being here and joining this discussion and to the audience. Uh, we hope to hear your views and perspective as well. Um, so why are you here today? Uh, we're going to discuss um, uh, basically um, um, together with a variety of stakeholders, possibly likely ways to cooperate in order to build uh, content recommendations optimized to achieve public interest uh, objectives. A couple of premises here to set the scene. So why is this important? Uh, what we do have uh, is that currently algorithms for content recommendation have a huge impact on the way people see, access and share uh, content um, and so information. So th those content recommendation algorithms, have, they have a huge impact on people's information diet and on a collective level on the information flow on in society. Uh, so therefore, this, this um, uh, type of services and of technology, because we're talking about algorithms, has a major impact, uh, among others, on uh, media diversity policy objectives, um, which we believe are a fundamental pillar of a democratic society. The other premise that I want to say, that I want to flag here, is that we're going to concentrate on content recommendation algorithms, which is something uh, slightly diff different from content moderation algorithms, because content moderation, they focus on the illegal content, illegal based on national rules or on the terms of services of a specific platform. Uh, and it's usually about removal or suspension of accounts, while content recommendation is a much wider environment in a way, because it's all about promoting, selecting, demoting, et cetera, et cetera, all the kind of content, and we're not necessarily talking talking about illegal content. In fact, most of the time, I would say we're not talking about the legal content at all. Uh, now, this premise was fundamental. Um, it's not that whatever we're going to discuss about won't work for content moderation as well, but I think we will need a separate discussion for that. Um, the third point that I wanted to raise is that um, the status quo for content recommendation algorithms, if we look around, is that those are basically uh, offered by private companies and uh, especially by large social media platforms. A few of them um, offer those content recommendation systems and they're optimized for profit reasons as uh, it should be because they're private companies. Uh, and they don't take into account public uh, policy objectives uh, that could be linked to the use of those recommended systems. Uh, so what we have is that a handful of players, um, sorry, a handful of algorithms are used by the vast majority of people they're optimized for profit and uh, they're uh, sort of indifferent to public policy objectives. The market is highly concentrated, so we're talking about very few uh, private companies that hold a lot of power. So the scenario is, is challenging both at individual and collective uh, level, but the focus of today's discussion is not about the harms that might or might not be created by this scenario, but it's how we can change the, the status quo if we wanted to. And um, in, in particular, what I would like to discuss um, today is um, which kind of barriers or market failures uh, we need to overtake if we want uh, this change to happen, which incentives exist or do not exist to change the status quo, and who should create those incentives and how, and uh, which kind of ste steps we should, um, we should take to, to change this scenario. If we can rely on existing rules, if we need something new, who is, who is supposed to intervene, legislators, regulators? Is this a business to business issue that can be solved at a commercial level only? What's the role of users? Which means what's the role of consumers, uh, sorry, of people, of individuals? And then the technical aspects of it, of course, because if we're talking about a variety, a plurality of content recommendation algorithms, is this feasible? Uh, how we need, uh, how we need to, um, to proceed to make um, a scenario, to create a scenario where alternatives are possible? Um, from Article 19 perspective, our contribution um, today is to sort of a throw a few ideas that we have to sustain in our policy discussion. So the first question would be um, basically, what, do we want to try to create content recommendation algorithms that are more sensitive or that are optimized for public policy objectives within the large platforms that already exist? So we need to work with the large platforms to fix or adjust their own algorithms, or we want to create more diversity. We want to create a different environment. We think it's, it's going to be, the latter is going to be better. 
because it will bring a number of uh, positive outputs. It will decentralize the power of the content recommendation. It will not ask just a few private companies to decide which level of diversity, if what we're going to optimize this for is exposure diversity, is not is needed by individuals and by society, um, which which would be a massive power for private companies uh, um, to be hold and in, in such a few hands with with no further guarantees. But also, it will create competition. And the hope is that this competition among different players will bring uh, more quality, more innovation, more alternatives. It will also empower users, individuals, uh, to make their own choices. So it, our way to solve this would be to go through pro-competitive remedies that open up the market, lower the barriers to entry, phase the barrier to entry to this uh, market, which is uh, currently quite closed, lower those barriers and encourage more actors to come in there. Um, more specifically, we have advocated for these changes in Europe recently uh, during the discussion for the Digital Services Act. And uh, unfortunately, what we have ad advocated specifically was that uh, we've started from the point that content recommendation is offered as a service in a bundle of other services. And we have said maybe the large online platforms, the very large online platforms in the wording of the Digital Services Act, they could be forced to unbundle the service and open the possibility for users to decide to go to another provider for this service and plug it in in their in their in, in their Facebook profile or their Instagram profile. Um, unfortunately, um, this proposal wasn't supported by the majority, so it's not in the final text of the Digital Services Act. There might be possibility to impose this sort of remedy. Um, through the Digital Markets Act, the other regulation has been recently approved at the European level, uh, because there is specifically one article, Article 612 of this Digital Markets Act, that, proposed that, that includes the possibility to impose to the gatekeepers in that wording, so uh, most probably the, sim the same platforms, uh, to provide um, access to competitors, to business users, uh, when it comes to their social network uh, services. This will imply, of course, uh, um, a degree of interoperability. Uh, because otherwise it's, it's going to be impossible to plug in an algorithm into a platform. Uh, so the technical aspects are once again very, very important here. And I'm, I'm curious to hear from the other panelists what they think about it. Um, but this could be one of the possibilities. Yet there could be um, questions remaining there. Also because I don't think there is a magic bullet here. I think what we need to do is to create a condition for an alternative scenario to flourish, but there might be a variety of components to be needed in, in here, just not just one single rule to fix it all. One of the major questions will be sustainability of is alternative. That, you have like 15 seconds just to wrap I need up. less. <laughs> okay. So the one of the, the discussion the, will be how sustainable are those different algorithms? What, what could be their business model? What could be the role of the state in this, in supporting, uh, uh, endorsing, etc.? And then um, the other thing is, do we need national rules for these, or national rem rem uh, remedies, or do we need to be more ambitious and think about regional or international uh, remedies? Thank you. Thank you so much, Isa, for prov providing the framework and the introduction. So now um, it's time for Ali Abbas Ali, the Director of Broadcasting Competition of COM. Um, based on what you have heard, uh, what should be the approach and what do we need to think about for this to be even possible? And when you hear the little sound, it means that your time is up, so please wrap it up. Thank you. Thank you very much, Marta, and um, thank you very much to uh, friends at Article 19 for this invitation. So um, I'm approaching this question from the point of view of the regulator with responsibility for media plurality in the UK. So wherever we end up in terms of harms and remedies, someone in a role like ours will have to implement it. With that perspective, I'd like to focus on three of the key questions that are on my mind. What does the evidence say? what is a proportionate response to the problem and will it work in practice and i hope that that touches on the uh, the areas that Issa raised so the uk evidence is really interesting uh, we published a report on this earlier in november and it shows that people who use social media most often for news are less likely to correctly identify important factual information they feel more antipathy towards people who hold different political views and they are less trusting of democratic institutions and the news media. All of that really matters. 
we didn't find the same patterns for people who use search engines or news aggregators to, most often to access news. We did a, an exhaustive literature review. It's in an annex to our report. And we found that social media use can have a polarizing effect. Uh, and there are two studies that show this on Facebook users in the USA. Uh, it was less clear through that literature review whether social media use causes changes in people's levels of news knowledge or in their levels of trust. So that, that question is still open. Now, our study was the first of its kind in the UK, and importantly, it didn't allow us to identify causality. It could be that social media has a polarizing effect, or it could be that people with a predisposition to those attitudes gravitate away from traditional media towards social media. And what that means is we need to do lots more work. Uh, it'll be hard and I can't make any promises, but we'd really like to get an answer to that causality question. So in terms of the three things on my mind, the evidence says there is definitely something to worry about. Uh, a lack of trust in news, being unwilling to engage in alternative viewpoints all erode the function and value of a plural media landscape. And somewhere in that social media is implicated. But ours was the first UK centric study uh, and it's not specific enough to guide our reaction. What it does tell us is there is a need for more transparency about how recommender systems and algorithms operate so that we can better understand what is happening. That takes me to my second question. What is a proportionate response? And the short answer, certainly from the UK perspective, is we don't know yet because the evidence doesn't lead us to a place where we can be certain what problem it is that we're trying to solve. So the proposal before us for public service algorithms provided by independent third parties that can give you an alternative set of recommendations to social media users could well be a valid option and, and there's real power to it. Um, but our view is a little, it's a little bit too early to say. Now, uh, I have a, an admission to make. Um, as a former telecoms regulator, this idea really does resonate with me because I can see real parallels with introducing downstream competition and unbundling local loops. And we know that worked, but we also know it was really hard. It was heavily litigated and there were casualties along the way. And that's why um, from where I am today, we need to keep the door open to collaborative working with the social media platforms. And in terms of specifics and things that are gonna challenge us, and that we need to be ready for, um, I'll give you a flavor with, with two of those. The first is commercial. Last year, working with a competition authority in the UK, Ofcom gave advice to the government on the bargaining relationships between large platforms and content providers, and with real focus on news publishers. We identified an imbalance in the bargaining power of platforms and publishers, and we advised that a code of conduct could help to address this. That was very much the question that we asked. But in doing that, we also found that there is, um, that the overall value of news content that is being generated and, and traded between platforms and publishers may not be quite as large as you think. So there's a, there's a huge market here, but the portion of it that is generated by news media uh, may be relatively small. So, what matters here is that the pool of value to share between platforms and publishers is already contested. And it's not necessarily one where a new party that does need to be paid would be welcome. And of course, if we're working with this, this hypothesis of third party independent algorithm providers, over time, they're gonna to wanna to grow their businesses um, and that'll add a source of tension into what is already quite a, a tense relationship. The second challenge is consumer behavior. Our research found that about half of people expressed a desire to have more control over what they see online. In contrast, a fifth were really happy just to leave everything to the platform. The, the internet is a big confusing world and someone was organizing for them. We then asked a related question and we found that about of half of people always accept cookies. Now, it's not an exactly analogous activity, but what it points to is, is something really important where we need to understand people's behaviors better. 
And that is the expressed desire for control and actually exercising that control when you have it may not be correlated. Now, we also know that the, the way that cookies are presented and so on is awful. So there's a whole load of, uh, of technical stuff that's, that's related in that that I won't go into. All of that just leads me to being cautious. Whatever solution that we have um, is someone's going to have to do the hard work of implementing it and making it work. And the risk is that you get into increasingly complex layers of regulation in order to address all of the sequential problems that you face. And that, that is something of, of our experience from unbundling local loops. But what we also know is introducing downstream players can work eventually. But there may be a better and faster way of getting to the societal outcomes that we're interested in, which doesn't involve um, all of that pain and some of the, the risks that are involved with it. And that's why, from a regulatory perspective, we're still keeping an open mind on, uh, on the appropriate remedy route. Um, what I can promise you is we are going to be doing a load more work on this. Um, our aim is, over the course of, of the coming year, to develop a, a set of proposals that we will present to the UK government of um, how it might uh, address the situation in the UK and to consult widely on those and to everybody who, who is here and who is interested um, yeah we we have our doors wide open um, and we're willing to, to listen to all and every view uh, on this and take them all into account because we recognize this is complex we recognize the solution may need international collaboration and so on and we're probably not going to be able to get there on our own um, and I hope, Marta, with that, I'm just in on time. No, uh, one minute, but it's okay. <laughs> so, uh, next is Natalie Helberger, professor of the Uni University of Amsterdam. So, Natalie, what is your view on this? And do you have other considerations or ideas we have to keep in mind when discussing this? You have five minutes. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Marta, and thank you for for inviting me, and also for putting this important topic on the agenda. Because I think um, we we cannot oh, under overestimate uh, the importance of exposure diversity, and why? Because exposure diversity, so exposing, giving people the opportunity to to read and hear news and media content from from a variety of sources uh, geared to different tastes and preferences in society is, is simply critical to advance a lot of goals that are and public values that are important for us. So we need exposure diversity to promote tolerance, to promote inclusiveness in a public debate, to uh, work against polarization, to increase political knowledge. There's ample of research showing that um, exposure diversity is a very important means to achieve a lot of goals uh, in, 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 in society. Um, and I agree actually with you, Isa, also about the importance of promoting initiatives to build more diverse recommender systems, metrics and measures also outside platforms. And I think in the past years, our focus has been very much drawn of how to yeah, deal with platforms, how to govern platforms. And I, I think in all these discussions, sometimes there was a tendency to forget a bit that there's, of course, a whole broad media uh, market out there and, and that we also need to look into how digital technologies can um, create new opportunities to for diversity also there. And I think the Ofcom um, investigations uh, along the last past years were really important in, in putting also this aspect on the agenda. And, and there are actually really good initiatives out there. So only last week I've, I've been participating in a one week workshop with academics and media organizations from Europe, from Canada, from Brazil who were experimenting of ways to, to build more diverse recommendation algorithms, more sophisticated algorithms that do not simply optimize for clicks or engagement, but for exposing people to more diverse views, to um, enriching their diet, to, to broadening their horizon, and by doing so actually make media much more fun and interesting. I think we shouldn't forget the fun factor here. 
people, and that is also something that our research show, are not interested in seeing more of the same and, and only content that is optimized to, to making them click on advertising. Actually, a lot of our respondents indicated that they very much care about not missing out important viewpoints. They care about um, being uh, news and media content being diverse, surprising and entertaining. Um, and that that are important considerations for them and also important distinguishing factors uh, in, in what could make for them a difference between the social media platforms and, 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 and media out there. And I think this is something that also the, the media really need to see how to yeah, develop further as a, as, as a selling factor and, and something that makes yeah watching media more attractive and as I said, also fun. Um, the problem with these initiatives is to be successful, they need support, they need institutional support, they need um, room, time and funding to invest in systems that optimize beyond clicks, because these are complex questions. Uh, this is nothing that you build in two months. So um, I, I think also within organizations, there needs to be more time and more room and more encouragement to also think ahead and not only focus on short time clicks, um, but also think about more um, diversity sensitive metrics. And, and I must say that even within public broadcasters, where you would actually assume that their mission is to provide diverse content and pioneer also in developing more diverse recommendation systems, even there, there's still a tendency to optimize for clicks. So I think there is work to be done also to create a favorable environment and encouragement within the institutions to um, to experiment with digital technology, how we can make it better, more diverse and more interesting. Um, so that is, I think, an important point to take into account. At the same time, um, Isa, I also do not share your pessimism about the DSA. Um, I think what the DSA said is, and first of all, I think it's good to acknowledge that we have here a really ambitious experimental piece of legislation of which you can also learn outside uh, Europe um, and and I think uh, a lot of eyes are on Europe trying to see how this experiment will turn out and I think we have a real opportunity here to make it work. Um, threats to pluralism but also threats to an inclusive tolerant and fair civic discourse are acknowledged explicitly in the DSA as systemic risks and exposure diversity as I just tried to explain as important means of mitigating those risks. And I think a key here is this provision in Article 35 of the DSA, which requires social media platforms to have risk mitigation strategies in place, which can include adapting their design and of content moderation algorithms and recommendation algorithms, and which arguably should include initiatives to optimize also for more than clicks and accuracy, but for example, also diversity. And because this is a really complex task, I think there are also fair arguments to make um, that we should, and, and that also it, it makes a lot of sense also for, for large media, uh, social media platforms to also look to the outside and all the creative initiatives that are already ongoing and experimenting with diverse news recommenders outside platforms and try to figure out how to give those also a space within the platforms. Um, there's also this one provision in the DSA telling, um, uh, mandating or suggesting that platforms should give users a choice between different recommendation parameters. And again, people appreciate this and they're looking for this. And so I think um, this is also an opportunity to, to think beyond what the DSA does right now, profiling or not but also see this as an invitation and a springboard to launch more experimental settings with diverse recommendation algorithms, including those that are developed outside the platform. So I'm, I'm actually um, very um, in favor of, of thinking along these lines and trying to figure out ways to in incentivize doing so. And I think, um, with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, now we have our last speaker, Michael Luen, CEO at Coco Tech. So Michael, what is your reaction to this proposal from the technical point of view? And what's basically the technical side of this in you have five minutes? Sure, and uh, thanks, Martha. So um, I think sharing my screen might be helpful. So I, I think um, um, this is a Facebook post. This is what a Facebook post is. Um, so to prove it, here's the link and the data for the Facebook pro post. Let's paste it. And then there's your, there's your Facebook post. And it's a, you know, it's a Myanmar television station, uh, has a video and it's covering a football game, right? Here's the same text as the text in the post. Oops. Um, we can only see the code. We cannot see the Facebook page. Oh, actually, I need to share my whole screen. Oops, sorry. So desktop one. Um, so yeah, here's the Facebook post. You can see it now, right? Correct? Yes, we can. Yes. Yeah. So, so this is the actual post. I just pasted the URL from this. And this is, this is Facebook's actual post data. And uh, so my response to it is all the comments are great, but I think the big tech companies are relying on regulators, maybe relative lack of understanding of how the sausage is made. Um, and I, whereas a very, very, like you could solve this today and it's actually easier than you think. Uh, I actually don't think it's terrifically complex. Um, it's just that it requires some technical, and I say this like having both domains. So I have a law degree, uh, and I also a uh, computer science master's degree. I'm pursuing. So, 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 this is Facebook's own API um, uh, called Crowd Tangle. They've exposed. Twitter has their own API, and uh, TikTok hasn't built one out yet. Um, Instagram has an API. So does Reddit. And this is what a post is. Um, it's it seems complicated. It's not. Like here's a here's your likes the number of likes thousand and eight let's see if it's right yeah there's over one k okay there's there's a breakdown of your shares this is called a JSON format and these are key value pairs this is the anatomy of a post so these social media companies all you have to do as a regulator in the U S okay maybe you have complicated First Amendment claims but I think certainly the U K and E U could just pass regulation on this um, requiring uh, social media companies to essentially expose these APIs either publicly or gate, maybe there's some gating requirements. Um, and uh, then you would have third party. This is like the, you know, the baby bell, uh, ma bell, you know, an outbreak up of AT&T right earlier. Um, whereas instead of like, you know, telephone lines uh, or spectrum, it's um, data, right? Um, you know, these social media companies have network effects. Uh, they're very well run and they have all these users. So um, it's hard to compete with that, right? Um, and so really uh, regulation compelling public APIs uh, where uh, providers, all, all, all providers need is data. And then creating training an algorithm on the data for diversity, for uh, policing of hate speech under international human rights law or other paradigms uh, is not that hard to build. It's just a matter of time and having the data. Um, so in my view, regulators, if they pass regulation requiring, let's say you could pick like, um, you know, under US law, it's like a, you know, uh, uh, Hartscott Redino filing thresholds. Like if the, the valuation of the company is above a certain threshold, if they're a big tech company, then they've got to expose public APIs to their post data and allowing independent third parties to uh, consume that API and then build the algorithms they want to build. So you could have a fate and then maybe, maybe prompt the social media companies to feature those algorithms to filter posts, right? So if you wanted a... Um, just making this up, if you want an algorithm that filters posts strictly uh, under the ICCPR's Article 19, right, um, that could be deployed in Facebook, right, or a third-party app version of Facebook. If you wanted, um, like, the ACL, the ACLU's version of it, you could, that could be deployed, right? Um, and the key is just the data 
Uh, and then, you know, perhaps uh, funding for initiatives for computer scientists and developers to build it. That's it. And um, once you do that, that, that would, I think, essentially be the equivalent of breaking up Ma Bell into Baby Bells. Um, <clears throat> people could pick and choose which social media platform to, to filter, you know, based on uh, how their content would be filtered. And they would be able to leverage the network effects van event. You know, Facebook has whatever it is, over 2 billion monthly active users. They would be able to leverage those network effects in a way that's pro-competitive. Um, and I think that this is basically the solution. Um, in the absence of regulation, so Facebook already has very restricted access to this API. And there's rumors that they're going to deprecate it, meaning like shut it down, right? Um, uh, Twitter has its API available, but uh, maybe with change, current change in management, maybe they will open it up even more. I think um, Elon Musk has expressed uh, that interest in that in the past, or maybe they shut it down. Um, whereas if a regulator compels the social media companies to build out these APIs and with the specific endpoints, you know, show all posts, be able to search through posts, um, um, then that data would be free. And, and you'd anonymize that data, right? So this is only like public accounts data. So people who have consented to having their, their data public, it's not private account data. I think that's important. But what are public accounts are all like the, the media page or social media influencer pages that, that are having such an effect on public discourse. So, um, so my view is this solution is out wide in the open. There's just regulators may not uh, have a full grasp of the technical, uh, like a scalpel instead of a hammer, sledgehammer, right? Um, you could pass if you could pass a law on this, and it would, it would, it would work. Um, and I'll I'll end my comments uh, with that. Thank you so much, Michael. Uh, so now we have time for Q and A. Uh, we welcome questions from the audience. I can see that there's a lot of people there. So if you want to participate, please go next to the microphone. I can't really see. Shall we just ask the question or? Yeah, who's, who's speaking? Sorry. Sorry um, that I can't see. Yeah, I'm uh, waving a little bit. Uh, my name is uh, Christian Jeffel. I'm professor for law, science and technology at uh, Technical University Munich. And I would really like to thank you um, also for bringing uh, this uh, this panel and um, kind of tackling this um, uh, problem in such a constructive uh, way. I really enjoyed uh, the presentations. Um, I have uh, one short question uh, for the last speaker. Um, so what's the limit of, um, uh, or um, do you see also dangers uh, in which uh, when the state uh, determines, um, uh, maybe also together with civil society, these uh, questions to such, uh, such a um, uh, great regard, I think it's uh, like an operation at the open heart of democracy. We cannot do um, uh, let companies do it, but it's also very complicated to, um, uh, to kind of uh, determine this from a, a public, um, publicly. And uh, the second question would be, um, uh, I was really interested in um, uh, Professor Helberger's idea to, um, to um, uh, increase a choice by regulation. Um, I feel that uh, the DSA, um, so the idea would be to force platforms to give um, uh, consumers more than one option. And um, I feel that the DSA actually stopped short here because um, the only um, mandatory um, alternative in the DSA is uh, basically um, to give one option without personalization, without, um, um, uh, yeah, without personalization. So my question would be whether we could be a little bit more progressive, uh, like in the online harms bill, um, I think here there is a clause for user empowerment, if I still have the last um, uh, last information on that. So there is a clause on user empowerment, which actually is more of an obligation 
to um, to force um, the companies to offer more than one um, uh, one option. And I feel this could be a step towards autonomy by design, because um, then the users would would start choosing and uh, would um, also present it, be presented with a meaningful choice, the same way that they now use cookies uh, or. Um, more often decline cookies because they have a meaningful choice uh, in many in many ways. So my question to the panel would be, could this be a solution to offer a meaningful choice to users for them to engage in that and then build up on, on that to bring um, these uh, public interest uh, algorithms uh, in? Thank you so much for your question. I'm going to read another one and then I'm going to ask the speakers to please uh, keep short concise answers to all the questions. The next question comes from Ariel Riera from ISOC's youth. She's from ISOC uh, Argentina. To what extent exposure to diverse news sources would ensure actual consumption of those news? Is there a risk of pushing some users to alternative, more partisan networks? Uh, and she gives some US scenarios. So I'm gonna ask the speakers to please uh, raise their hand to please answer the questions. So I think Michael, you were first, so sorry. I have to be a dictator. Go first, please. Uh, so uh, I think to the, um, so I think to the first of the, I think the questions are around like choice, right? So um, <clears throat> Yeah, I think, you know, civil society, so right now the big tech companies have all the cards. So when civil society does review, it's because Facebook gives them a grant to do the review. And so Facebook can just stop giving them grants, which is what happens. Um, whereas if you just had publicly exposed um, API endpoints, then civil society can train, uh, can have a particular content point of view uh if if uh you know other other if fox news wants to go and and train they can do that and then let the let cons consumer choice basically let people choose um um uh what version of facebook they want to look at and that might lead to um a different kind of attack on problems um uh uh that's certainly possible, but to me, it at least increases uh, consumer choice. And I'll let other people respond. Thank you, Michael. Shall I chime in? Yeah, Natalie, and then I. Yeah, uh, yeah. Thank, thank you a lot. And 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 to your second question, I, I mean, I I couldn't agree more with you. I had hoped for more uh, in the DSA, so some some obligation to offer different choices. At right, right now, it's mandatory. Um, I should also point out that another important international standard setting organization, the Council of Europe, went a step further and also very much encourages. Um, to offer more diverse choices and, and choice from different recommendation algorithms. Um, I still think that um, via the uh, risk mitigation provisions in the DSA that, that they could be read as a means to um, encourage um, the uh, providing provisions or conditions for, for external and players in this area. Because, as I mentioned earlier, I think exposure diversity is a solution to a lot of these problems that, that we are trying to tackle with the DSA. And, and there's a lot of expertise out there, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's a wise choice to see how we can make them work also for platforms um, and, and, and by this way uh, make, plat yeah, make, make the offer also more appealing to users. So I, I could even imagine that there is a business argument to be made why it is a good idea to open up. And um, I, I really, really liked um, your, um, your, your, your presentation, Michael, on how to, um, uh, how, how this is actually much less utopic than, than we thought. Regarding ex the question about exposure diversity, um, ex I, I think it's important to point out exposure diversity is not the same like consumption diversity of so um, it is merely offering people a diver more diverse choice that they would otherwise not see. So it is enhancing choice. 
but not forcing anybody to watch particular things. And again, from our research, it transcended that actually this is something that a lot of users would appreciate greatly. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, I um, actually, I think I'm, I'm probably going to repeat a lot of what uh, what Natalie has just said. Um, so just, yeah, philosophically, I think we are we are very much in the position that um, today choices are being made for consumers. So, you know, Facebook or whoever it is, is interpreting the things you like, the things you read, the things you follow, and is giving you choices on the basis of that. But the user is not necessarily in any way active in uh, in that relationship they are passively then being given um, uh, information off the back of that and and what matters here for us is to what extent does that change the user's behavior um, the the question of choice then becomes really interesting because once you give people choices will they act on them and that's the, the the comment that we have in the in the chat uh, points to that but the role of the regulator here, certainly as, as our role is constituted, um, is just to make sure that the choices are available. That there isn't a party that controls your access to the breadth of plural media that's available, that you as a, uh, as a, uh, as a consumer, as an audience, as a citizen, can reach those choices. You may then choose to say, I will go to a heavily right-wing source, I will go to a heavily left-wing source or, or whatever, I will read hate speech, I will read misogyny. That is a, a, a level beyond where you start interfering with people's freedom to receive information and that that is a, a hard barrier that, that we need to, to really think about carefully. The, the limits of where we are and the limits of, of, of where uh, we think plurality regime intervenes is just to make sure that of the wealth of information that's available to you it's not being constrained by someone who is not in your direct control you have access to all of it what you then choose to do with that access which might be to completely ignore it or it might be to exercise it to its full or exercise it in a way that you know the majority of people wouldn't like that really is your freedom to choose Thank you, Ali. And Isa raised her hand as well. Yes, uh, just to uh, build on top of what Ali has just said, uh, I think what we're discussing here is pro-competitive issues to sort of open up a market, right? And I'm a competition lawyer by background, and I was taught, uh, not often, because there are different ideas about this, but I, I was taught that it cannot be competition if then there is not education to the freedom to choose. Um, so. Every time we talk about the possibility to empower users to take um, a little bit more space that's been uh, taken off from them uh, to make uh, choices, um, it's a sort of a, a, um, an essential component of having competitive uh, and open markets. Uh, I do believe, uh, I agree on the fact that um, uh, we've been made past and this is something that has, has gone on for about 20 years. And that's why people now, their behaviors show that a number of people, they're reluctant to make the choices uh, because we've been, we've been made this way. We've been made to believe that um, we had to lose our imagination and there was no either, you know, this uh, take it all or lose it all situation. Uh, but I think we as civil society or as researchers or, or as a regulator, we need to, to sort of uh, make sure that um, the discourse, uh, the boundaries of the discourse are much more stretched than what we are, we are being made to, uh, to believe. And also in this situation, uh, I do agree uh, that uh, currently uh, there, there is the risk that people could make um, a number of choices that we might agree or disagree with, that's okay, uh, but it's part of their autonomy. And we need to balance off other much more paternalistic uh, and invasive uh, solutions, especially so because actually currently this sort of paternalistic decisions will not be taken by any sort of public power, but mostly by private power, which per se is even less legitimated to take these uh, decisions. Uh, so I think we need to look at a big picture here and see, okay, there might be some risks, there might be some trade-off, but are those trade-offs trade-offs that society can take 
And what's the counterfactual? Which are the other trade-offs that we need to take if we don't uh, act this way? So I, I think it's, um, as I said at the very beginning, it's not a one-way route. It's not so simple. We might don't fix it all with one specific rule, uh, but I don't think we need to be afraid of creating choices for people. We, I don't think we need to be afraid of tackling a challenge and saying, you know, there is the risk that people will go somewhere else. Fine, we might have other ways. We might have um, literacy uh, policies that we can use, education. Um, this freedom to choose that I mentioned, we might need to educate, again, people, consumers, individuals to this freedom. Uh, but I would, I would go in that direction. I would carefully, um, I would be very, very careful not to take the opposite direction. Yeah. Thank you, Isa. Um, is there any other question from the audience? We still have time for one more. Yeah, there's a question. Hi, uh, my name is Brandy. I'm a researcher who studied YouTube's recommendation algorithm. And my question is about the uh, proposal around diversification of news media sources. I'm wondering, um, how does this scale when content classification, particularly video content classification, uh, particularly in languages outside of English, is still such a nascent field? How do you do that effectively? Um, to ensure that it's not just you know creating a list of basically major media brands and ensuring exposure on both sides, but considering that people develop you know political and social viewpoints from say influencers or bloggers or you know lots of other uh, media sources. Thanks. Thank you, Brandy. Um, anyone wants to answer from the speakers? I don't have an answer to that, but I have an additional element that I can raise, and maybe uh, you know this is something that is much more technical than a policy issue. Um, I do believe that this has a lot to do with the fact that when we talk about uh, country recommendations right now and the systems that we're, we, we're, we're dealing with right now, they have a global scale. And so they operate on a global scale and they're usually set for the mainstream. Uh, and they apply the mainstream as it is in each and every other context. So they're detached from a lot of different contexts. Um, and this is true for content moderation as well as for content recommendation, as, as well as for video content classification, et cetera. So maybe a way to try to address this issue, and this is an open question, is to bring the prov provision of the service closer to the community that is gonna use this service, because those providers, they will understand the context better. They will be able to do a batch better classification. They will understand a lot of the details that will be missed if, the global, the big platforms, they reason in a one-stop shop solution for everybody. Thank you, Isa. Ali, and then Natalie, and then we go to the wrap-up session. Ali? Um, I think all I would say is that, um, and, and you know, both Isa and I have raised the, the competition points. One of the things you need to be acutely uh, um, uh, aware of here is the probability or possibility of embedding business models and that you foreclose on the ability of innovative models or new players to enter a market because the regulation that you have um, allows Facebook to say, well, I've opened my API as, as Michael suggested and therefore things are happening and other people who don't have the scale to do that and so on then uh, find that the ability to launch their model or the regulatory environment in which they put that model is, is more difficult. So um, it is always a risk. Whenever you introduce a piece of uh, regulation that embeds one particular way of working or favors one particular way of working, what does it do to the rest of the market? And um, uh, it is it is just something you must have in the forefront of your mind as you go forward to regulate. I'm not saying it's an intractable problem. I'm not saying it can't be solved. What I'm saying is that you can't lose sight of it. Um, otherwise, you may you may actually make things worse rather than better. Thank you, Ali. Natalie. Yeah, three 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 things. First of all, um, to build up on what what Ali said, um, I mean. Partly, uh, the, these are new questions, right? So we we are experimenting also with regulation, and and I think so. Something that that I, I found very convincing, for example, um, being forwarded in the AI regulation, is this idea of sandboxing and and creating environments that 
actually allow companies as well as regulators to to experiment and see what works and not. So I think we also need to change our ideas of regulation and and allow for more agility here and 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 a sense of experimentation for for the bigger good. Um, the second thing is I I would actually like to, um, yeah have a word of caution that scalability i mean i know that scalability is an important argument but it is definitely not the only uh, important argument uh isa you already mentioned smaller communities i think especially also there's a lot of demand in, in local communities for more diversity in recommendations so i think um scalability is not everything and the third thing is the question that you asked also refers about how do we make it work in practice, right? So diverse recommendations, there's no technological quick fix. We tweak the algorithm a bit and suddenly there's diversity. It also requires us to, to invest in, in good metadata. It invests us in, 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 in skills, in training, in models. Um, and that's, I think, why it is important that we also think of how can we create an enabling environment for making um, progress in, in diversifying algorithms, um, creating more diverse metrics and, and understanding better of what uh, all the good and cool things are that we can do with recommendation algorithms. And I think that is something important to keep in mind. Thank you, Natalie. So now we are finalizing this session. Um, we have one last round. Basically, we have a question for all the speakers. If you had the power to address this issue tomorrow, who would be the, the key stakeholder you, were, you would address and what would be your first ask? You each have one minute and if it's okay, we can start the other way around, meaning Michael, then Natalie, then Ali, and then Isa. So Michael, you have one minute. Sorry, what was the, the, the question exactly? I kind of didn't- You have the power to address this issue tomorrow. So who would be the first? a key stakeholder you would address and what would be your first ask? Yeah, regulators just require, you know, big tech companies above a certain X valuation size, you can base it off of antitrust thresholds uh, to publicly expose uh, APIs related to post data. And just, you know, there's probably like 20 endpoints and uh, require them not to like throttle or hide the data in any way. And uh, I think this would, and then maybe also, uh, you know, maybe they have to have some screening like the app stores, but if a, if a third party provider has, you know, trained an algorithm um, on a data set, um, then they would have to list that uh, as an, as a filtering option in like Facebook's newsfeed or Twitter. Like you could literally just have like a drop down menu. Oh, I want to filter posts by the algorithm by article 19 or by uh whatever duke university and and you'd get filtering um and uh it's uh that's what i would do that's the that's it and it's and, uh, and again i kind of emphasize if that's done the computer science work is much easier than you think like I don't, yeah that's awesome. thank you thank you michael uh natalie if you had the power to address this issue tomorrow, who would be the first stakeholder you would address and what would be your first ask? Yeah, so I would ask uh, address all those developers, editors, researchers, uh, people within media organizations, within platforms, but also standalone services that are already experimenting with more diverse recommendation metrics and measures and trying to figure out ways to uh, move more into the direction of public service uh, inspired algorithms. So I, I would address those and ask them, what do you need to, to make this work and to, to, to succeed in what you're doing and try to give it to them? Thank you, Natalie. Ali, same question. So um, I, I, first of all, um, I, I would uh, agree with both Michael and, and Natalie. So I'm gonna go in a slightly different direction. Um, and uh, our stakeholders being citizens, uh, the thing I'm acutely conscious of is um, I am a Generation X regulator, um, but the market in which 
the um, the, the regulation is um, is going to land is one which is going to be increasingly dominated by Generation Z. We call them digital natives, and I don't think people of my generation certainly have a really good understanding of the way that younger people use and uh, understand the digital environment. And so the stakeholders I would like to talk to and the ones whose needs I would like to really understand are those people who have grown up with the internet, who you know, in our early conversations with them demonstrate that they are incredibly clever, they are incredibly savvy, they understand their world in a way that my generation can't. And if I'm going to be setting regulation that's going to last 10, 15, 20 years, I need to be conscious of that is the group that I'm regulating for. And I need to talk to them. I need to understand them. I need to understand what they need and what they want. Thank you, Ali. Isa, same question. It's going to be very difficult now to pick one and add on, on something uh, meaningful. Um, let me try to put it this way. I do believe that everything has been said is absolutely crucial. I am still personally convinced that one of the main roots of this problem is the concentration of power. So I do believe that the first person I would go and talk to is a regulator and say the incentives to open this, um, this environment are not there. We need to create incentives. You need to create incentive. And how and when and which direction and what exactly do we need? then we need to discuss with all the other stakeholders. Uh, but without in the imposition of, of uh, certain, um, certain specific uh, obligations to open the environment, this is not going to happen per se. It hasn't happened in 20 years' time, and I don't see why the situation is going to be uh, changing by itself in the next five to 10 years. So that would be my choice, I suppose. Thank you, Isa. And now I'm going to give you the power to answer the a very last question. Sorry, I have to pick someone. Uh, this is the last question. Uh, isn't this idea of middleware and expanding choice a recipe for fragmentation of a public sphere? Like in one minute, if you can answer it. So we go the other way around then, or we just, uh, you know, I'll, I'll try to, to, to go yeah, like on and then two, possibly- 30 yes. seconds and maybe someone else, go ahead. Um, so I believe that the idea of creating uh, middlewares is not necessarily an alternative to having uh, a public sphere because the way the different communities or the different recommended systems will need to interact uh, with the existing uh, big uh, platforms, it's to be decided and needs to be defined. So when we talk about interoperability, for example, we can talk about different degrees of interoperability. And we can talk about allowing people to work within a platform or a competition in between the different platforms. So we can keep a public, uh, a public sphere, let's say, but populate this public sphere with a number of alternatives for people. And uh, we can make it work, I suppose, from a technical perspective. Um, so I, I don't see those two as black and white situations and no compromise in the middle. Thank you, Natalie. Uh, right now, platforms are already highly personalized. So um, I, there you already have quite a uh, fragmentation. What we're discussing here is partly also a solution to that problem. Plus, I think we should also remember that peop many people multi-source. They luckily do not only receive the news from platforms. They also receive the news from, uh, from, from, from media, from legacy media. And that is also another argument why it's important to not only look into solutions within platforms, but also outside platforms, how to strengthen a resilient media ecosystem. And I think we really need to think about these questions very hard, especially in the light of very strong, powerful players on the market. So how can we protect a resilient and diverse media system? I think that is the key response to the fragmentation concern. Thank you, Natalie, and thank you everyone for being here. It was a pleasure for Article 19 to host uh, this panel. So see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank, bye. thank Bye. You. bye.